Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of The Grittiest Take. As here in this edition of The Grittiest Take, I'm joined by the wonderful Jason Petitus. You can obviously check him out on Myers Daily during the season and also sometime, of course, he does podcasts in the offseason as well. Check him out there. We're going to be talking about the speculation, not fully official yet, but it pretty much seems like it's everything but pretty much the stones here and the person's right next to etching it. So it's pretty much where that's at with John Tortorella. So we're going to talk about some of the guys that gain and some of the guys that lose in the uh, um, era, I guess, is a way to put it. But first and foremost, Jason, how are you doing on this one? Doing good, man. I'm trying to enjoy the off season. Um, it's a grind during the season, so just trying to enjoy the downtime now, get to the pool with the kids and chill out and recharge over the summer and by the time august hits i'll be chomping at the bit to to get back after it but trying to enjoy a little bit of time now watching the cup final which starts tonight so looking forward to that as well yeah we'll probably also touch on that do some predictions and stuff that would be a good idea to do later in the show talk about that a little bit at the end as well but i think when it comes to tortorella the interesting thing is one um who's he's going to mess with the best obviously came back and so we know that's a cold heart given he already loves John Tortorella but other guys who he's going to mess with the best in your thoughts who do you think stands to I guess we'll start with gain gain the most as our player share uh when it comes to acquiring somebody assuming it's made official with John Tortorella I mean I think there's certain guys that are obvious that any coach would love to coach and you know guys like Sean Couturier you know he's kind of I always say when they're juggling lines, there's a line outside the coach's door for guys going, can I play on his line? Because he lightens the load for everybody on the line from a defensive standpoint to allow them to be a little bit more offensive, which obviously players love to do. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously a guy like Couturier, you mentioned Atkinson, who's played for him before. And I talked to Cam about him uh, on my podcast at the end of the season about Tortorella and he had rave reviews about him. I've, I've talked to a lot of guys that played for him that really had a good experience playing for John Tortorella. You know, the narrative is that players don't like playing for him. It's kind of a, a made-up media narrative because of the way Torts burns hot in his availabilities and stuff. But, um, you know, those, those two players in particular, I think Joel Farabee's another guy uh, that will really kind of get Torts's confidence right away plays the game the right way torts looks for guys that are honest players he's not asking you not to be offensive to be defensive but he's asking you to be responsible in all three zones and if you do that and you play the game in an honest way you know you obviously be rewarded with it with situational play and those kind of things um, so i look at those guys in particular i think travis sandheim's another guy torts runs a really aggressive four check two one two spread and he really encourages his D to join the rush. And I look at Travis Sanheim last year who really developed that barometer at his head of when to go, when not to go and join the rush and use his greatest asset, which is his skating to, to jump up in plays and create. I think he's another guy that can really benefit. I think a guy like Rasmus Ristolainen as well, who plays the game obviously with a lot of the same kind of passion that Tortorella brings to the table of physical accountability. And I think he's another guy yet Risto's going to make mistakes and he's going to have times when he overplays situations trying to be physical and, you know, he, he's going to fall into some of those same traps that he always falls into. But I think he's another guy, along with Sanheim, who developed a little bit of chemistry last year that can benefit from it. And, you know, I'll be interested to see with guys, you know, some of the younger guys like Owen Tippett or, um, you know, Travis Konechny, how they kind of assimilate with, uh, with John Tortorella and how they pick up what, he's asking them to do so you know there, there's going to be some question marks you mentioned Provorov I think he's a guy that can really kind of reclaim his trajectory in the NHL under Tortorella you know one of the things with Provy he's got offensive elements to his game as long as he has a consistent partner that he's got chemistry with I think that's the big thing for Provorov is having that consistency and partner because you got to play on instinct out there. You can't be thinking. And when your partner's constantly shuffling around, I think that's difficult on a top pairing guy. So, um, you know, a lot obviously depends on Ryan Ellis's health in that regard. But uh, he's a guy I think that can, can really excel under Twitterell as well. He's had D that have had really good offensive seasons towards. And, yeah. 
you know, he likes to play guys a lot of minutes. I mean, Seth Jones was a horse for him. I imagine that Provorov can be that horse for him as well. Yeah, I also think the big guy I loved getting towards for because I really liked how Sanheim in – when you perform really well in I – mean, chaos might be a little strong, but we'll just use that as the adjective for now uh, in kind of how last year was going. Fairby's the same thing. I think, like, he, if you can perform at least good or very well in a kind of weird season that there's just a bunch of chaotic stuff going on, you know, really, you know your coach is probably not going to be the head coach next year. That speaks volumes to you just being able to stay very zoned in and very focused on you being the best version of the hockey player you can be. And I think both of those guys really impressed me on that front that I think with Torch, they're really going to even get better. Like, Prover, or not Prover, off of Sanheim. Almost, I know my one friend and I, when we game all the time, we talk about it. He almost reminds you a little bit of Pelic, how once he got in his mid-20s, he had that first hit year. And then once he had that hit year, the hit year turned into being great year on end and being a very good overall defenseman. And obviously, if that happens for Sanheim, I think anybody would take that. So I feel like I'm confident he's going to really help those guys. The guy that I'm most interested to see is Morgan as a youngster, just because Will he let Morgan Frost first just say, open it up? Like, well, I'm going to put you on with the two best defensive wing. He's going to keep him at center. I'm going to put you with the two best defensive wingers I can put on your wing. So, like, say if it's Cates and, I don't know, Scott Lawton, if you're going to put him on the wing instead of center. And you're going to be the guy, just take advantage of the offensive zone. These guys will get you. I'll make sure you're on the ice with the best defenseman, too. And then worry about his defense later because you want to get his confidence up as much as possible. Or is it kind of going to be like the wrong way that I think AV tried to do, which is kind of do everything at once, which obviously, at least in my opinion, didn't work. So, like, he's the most interesting guy to follow for me because I still like Frost a lot. And from interviewing him with, uh, doing some phantom stuff it seems like his accountability has really got better as he's matured like he will say like oh i have to do better like i have to where he's got and that's all towards once like if you're doing bad i've found from like i know when they covered it with pld people would say he wasn't always the best at admitting his flaws all the time so if you have somebody like frost that does miss the wide open net at this point of his career i found he's a guy that's like oh, i should have hit that wide open net that was my fault my big guys that was a shitty play that's all John Tortorella wants because then he knows you're in your mind going, cool, this is what I have to do at night. You're thinking every time, this is how I'm going to fix that next time. If you're not mad at yourself, you're not probably thinking, how am I going to fix this next time? So I think that's honestly a good characteristic that it might help Morgan. But Tippett, I feel I could just like just because Tippett, he might have to even – this is me saying this about John Tortorella, but Dave, Owen, or not Dave Tippett, Owen Tippett might be a guy that he even has to tone down a bit because he's almost like Wade. He just runs through brick wall after brick wall the, with his speed, where some of the times those guys, you want to say, look, we love how you play the offensive game, but we also need you on the ice so you can play that offensive game as much as possible. Let's try to manage both. That's what I think Torch will get good at doing with this team and you're going to listen to him because he has the track record. I think that's the biggest thing. Well, yeah, I mean, look, the big thing with torts is accountability. And the biggest thing for any professional athlete is having self-accountability. You know, when yep. you're at home at night by yourself, are are you making excuses for why you made a mistake? Is it everybody else's fault? Or are you putting the onus on yourself and thinking about what you can do better? And I think that that's what, one of the things that torts does well. He holds a mirror in front of players' faces and, He's not telling them in he, what he says in the media is nothing he hasn't already said to their face. And he's blunt and you always know where you stand with them. And that accountability, I think, is something, you know, that if you have it already, good. If, you, if you're if you lacking it, you're going to gain it real quick or there, the, there's consequence. So I think that that's something that will be preached from the moment he holds his first team meeting. That it is about accountability and it's not about you. It's about the guy next to you. And it's about you know, doing everything for that guy and doing everything for the cumulative for the team. Because if we're not willing to do the things it takes for the guys next to us in the room, then we're not going to go anywhere because you can't win in this sport trying to do it on your own. And you can't win in this sport trying to blame your deficiencies on others. It's just not the way it works. So th those are things that I think Tortorella brings to the table right away. And, and I think it's an interesting offseason for Morgan because I thought he made some steps last year in a sideways season. Um, there's obviously more expectations now at this point in his development and in his trajectory. So 
he's going to have to have a real good off season and come in and, and put it on the ice and prove it. Yeah, I agree. And I think, like I said, I think the first step of Frost was realizing in his physical maturity what he needs to do and taking the accountability. And once you have that side, I think that also helps in anything in life. When you're more accountable, you tend to become more confident because you are willing to admit your flaws. So therefore, you realize your strengths more, too. So I feel like that doesn't just apply to sports. That applies to literally anything. So I feel like Frost is starting to do that, and that's kind of what's helping them out now. And I, I feel like next year with John Tortorelli, he actually could have a pretty damn good year. Because if he does put him on with two defensive players on his line and just says, look, you're the offensive guy on this line, do your thing, that that might be the best-case scenario for more than I don't think that's the, great, the greatest move. I would actually put him out there with another offensive player. Put him out with other – okay. Maybe. Yeah, I think, I think he's a player that needs to play with guys that can think the game offensively like he can. Um, because if you're putting him out there with a couple of guys that can't execute offensively, one guy is never going to be able to do that in the offensive zone. You're just going to key on him, and you're going to be able true. to shut him down. So I, I would I would not be in favor of that. I would be more That's in favor of putting him so with skilled players. Use, so who would you do as a, if we had the team now and didn't change it that much minus like maybe one or two forwards? What would you Well, do? I mean, I liked the combination with, with him and Tippett last year. I thought those two worked well together. I did like that. Yeah, Tippett's got a little more size and really can skate, and obviously Morgan can skate and has got great vision and great hands. Uh, who the other winger? I, I tend to look at things not in lines, more in pairings, even offense, even with the the guys up front. You know, you always kind of looked at it like, okay, Drew and Couturier, and then that third winger was either Konechny or was it, you know, a guy, you know, a, a different guy that you would move into there, maybe Atkinson or whoever. I tend to find two guys that work well together and try to find that third piece. So, I, you know, who that third guy is for Frost and, and Tippett, I'm not sure yet. you got to see how things come together in camp and, you know, what changes made. If, is Wade Allison a part of the picture? You know, where are things falling? Is Morgan playing in the middle? And, um, you know, do they make an acquisition at center? Is JVR still on this roster? There's so many questions. So, but but I liked what I saw with those two players in particular together. So that's something obviously I would I would take a long look at at camp. Yeah, and then Noah. Speaking of, since Cage was on that line with them, I was impressed with how quickly he brought himself to the NHL. Because I remember saying when he came in from watching college, I thought he'd be defense first at first, and then bring on the offense. And he basically said, "Screw that! I'm going to be good at defense and also be good at offense in the first whatever it was, 15 games." So. I think that high is not going to obviously play out through the rest of his career. If it did, then you got one of the bigger steals in the draft. But what do you think the realistic kind of expectations are for like a third line defensive player or something? Like, what do you think the realistic expectations are for Cates that also can chip in offensively? Like, where would you kind of peg him at? For Cates? Yeah, for Noah Cates. I mean, he's a bottom six for me. He's a, he's a smart player and. High hockey IQ, you know, knows where to be in all zones. In neutral zone, I thought he was really good. I was really surprised at how well he played in the neutral zone. I, I look at the neutral zone as the most consequential zone in the game because you can usually identify a period that or something that happens in the neutral zone that either determines why you scored a goal or why you got scored on. <laughs> so I think that, you know, it's kind of the forgotten zone, and I thought he was really good there. But, you know, I looked at, you know, if I have a, a team that, has got a good top six and he's playing on the third line or, or the fourth. I mean, ideally he'd be a fourth line player because you have enough skill and depth to force them there. Will they have that next year? That I don't know. It depends on how this off season plays out. Also depends on players like Bobby Brink. Is he starting with the Phantoms or is he starting with the Flyers? I suspect he may start with the Phantoms, but we'll see. So how that plays out and how the roster is constructed with, you know, right wingers in particular and, uh, will be interesting to see how you know it develops out going forward. Where does Faraby fit in? Is is he a top six guy? Is he playing with Hayes or is he playing with Couturier? I, I think we know he's not going to be playing in the middle ideally, and they won't have the same center, you know, kind of injury situation they had last year. And again, Lawton, you mentioned, is he playing in the middle or is he yeah. playing on the wing? So all big and questions. Lezinski's health, well, you would think is healthy next season coming in so yeah. if you have him in the picture if he impresses in camp so they have a lot more at center than they did this year because of the like you were saying the injury bugaboo that 
the Flyers yeah, they, can, can those guys stay healthy? <laughs> that's yeah, that's the big thing that's with Tanner thing. too, because Tanner has these injuries where he'll end up throwing a dart and somehow injures him. So like, yeah. like you have to like he has those unlucky ones too. So uh, you have to yeah hope those guys stay healthy. Wade's the biggest one. You have to hope stays healthy because Wade, I think, could be especially with how aggressive he likes playing in Torch system, I think could be good. But you also have to temper, kind of like I was saying with Tippett, you can't have guys going through seven brick walls because they're just going to get injured too often and they're going to be good when healthy, but that's the key. They're going to be good when healthy. You need them as healthy as possible. So I feel like that's kind of the biggest thing they got to do. And then hopefully Forster doesn't start having, as he continues to develop injury bugs, but that was one year thing, so I'm not worried about it yet. Samuel Urson was a one year. When it's a one year thing, I don't tend to trip over it until it's a consistent thing going forward. Mm-hmm. So those guys, I'm not worried about yet. But if it starts happening more consistently, it'll get in the Allison territory of okay, now you have to kind of adjust your game a bit so you can actually play in the NHL. And I know Lappy's even said that when I've listened to interviews with Bob, like we ha- we've been honest with them about how I think it was him and Sandine they were talking about, about how you guys have to be aggressive like you are, but be smart about it. You can't injure yourself. Yeah. So, uh, you, you have, have to make to that business that. decision once in a while too, you know, you, because you know, th- the greatest skill to have for a professional athlete is availability. It doesn't matter how good you are if you're never available. So you got to play the game true to yourself and the way you play it. And, you know, obviously Wade plays it with a lot of physicality and, but he's also, you know, he's got to find a way to, to stay healthy. And he, I just fear that he's like Samuel L. Jackson and Unbreakable. Some people never get hurt. Some people always get hurt. And it it's not been the same injury repeated with him. It's just weird injury after weird injury. You just hope that, you know, that part's in the rearview mirror. He can move his career forward and, and not have to keep dealing with this. Yeah, that's what I would hope because I think could be a hell of a player if he can. I also think Tanner, if he can stay healthy, can be at least a fourth-line center because he's quick, he's good in all zones too, and got very good at face-offs last year. So if he can do that, that, that speaks fourth-line center yeah. to me because nowadays you want to have quicker guys. Well, I, I still like Strom as a prospect, but I don't know if we'll make it because of the whole you need to have quicker guys thing now. Granted, there's a lot of centers still in the league. Like, I don't know, Zegmus Regersens, who was on the fourth line of – he's not too quick, but they put him on a line with guys that are quicker. So you could also get away with doing that if the guy's very good face-off-wise and good in all zones. So it depends. The Flyers have options going forward, let's put it that way. And it's always good to have options when it comes to coming into camp. But a guy that I'm really happy for because I had the pleasure of phoning him yesterday is Wiley seems to be a guy that might blend well with Torts as a if he decide if he's able to make this he already blends well with Lappy and uh, Lehigh but if he makes the team because he mentioned how Williams with the silver tips had a harsh side to like if he had to he would get up on your grill and he said he liked that so I feel like if Wyatt Wiley's able to crack the roster because. Some of these other guys you might be beneficial, like a Tard, for example, or Adder, for example, I mean, to develop instead of having them platoon in and out because that doesn't make any sense when you're trying to develop some. Where Wiley's kind of already developed, so if he's your sixth, seventh, and gets in enough games, it's still not going to impede his development if, say, he plays 35, 40, and gets in. Because Torch seems on most of his teams just have that. For us, it won't be a random guy, but for most people, like that random extra guy that he really likes for forwards and defense on all of his, like it was in Columbus and New York and Tampa. He always has a guy that is like, oh, cool, this guy really started developing under Tortorella. Good for that guy. That worked out well for him. And I feel like with the way Wiley talked about loving Williams, his coaching style that way, if he can make the team, he can kind of be that extra defenseman when there's injuries that Tortorella likes. Or even if someone sucks, hopefully that doesn't happen. But if somebody struggles, yeah, he can I think get in a, more play. I think it's a already. reach for him because, I mean, you well, still have Zamula, you got Cam York um, that are going to be looking to make this team, and you just don't want to have that much youth on your blue line. You can't have that much inexperience. You know, it, it's okay to have some young players, and Torts will have some young players and his developed guys, but I can't imagine a situation where he's going to want a ton of youth on that blue line. Um, because of the way he preaches the game. And a lot of it obviously depends on Ryan Ellis and what they do this summer as a safeguard if Ellis is or isn't available. So um, that's a roster spot, obviously. If 
you got to you got to have some kind of fail safe because if Ryan Ellis only comes out and plays four games the next year, you can't have the same situation of trying to plug that hole the way they did this past season. And having that much youth on your blue line is is a really that's a tough pot um, for an NHL team that's trying to move forward with a young goalie and establish a new identity and a new system. I just think that 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 would probably be unlikely. Um, it, for, as you know, I think you're going to get Cam York. I think he's going to make the team. Yeah, I think so. so I, I, I doubt you're going to see a guy like Wiley be there as well. No, yeah, I could see a lot of that. I just, I feel like he's on the cusp and we brought everybody else up. It's one of those guys you bring everybody else up but him yet, so mm-hmm. to speak, and you tend to have a few of those in each organization around the league. Well, I feel like Wiley is definitely that guy for the Flyers where it's like, oh, everybody else has kind of got NHL time. But so it's like, that that's the only reason why I feel like he's, Injury-wise, though, hopefully we don't have as much. I feel like he would be one of the first if he's doing well with Lehigh, especially if yeah. a righty goes And it depends. Down. Yeah, it depends yeah. who goes out, too, right? Yeah. yeah. If a right-hander like if goes down, yeah, if it fit in. But I know uh, you, obviously, Jason, as being a guy that still – I think do you still play in some leagues as a goaltender? I just – I think I retired. You retired now? Okay, well, you did I think for a I... while – <laughs> okay. At least we <laughs> I did. I, I'm pretty sure I'm retired now. I, I turned 50. <laughs> the last game that I played, I caught a pretty good concussion. So I uh, took a good a good shot right to the grill. So I think I'm retired. I'm not positive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you get that bug for you love playing the sports, like I love playing most things, uh, it's, it's just fun to keep going, even if your body's like, yeah, it's not the best idea. Like, no, screw that. I'm going to. But uh, the, the plan I, part's I great. You know, time. the plan is fine. It's the at 50 at plan. You know, I haven't played the game for 45 years. Um, My hips obviously are, are pretty shot. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. have to have hip, double hip replacement at some point here in the next probably five years. And it's just the next day that it's tough. And because when I play too, I don't like to play in like some of the lower beer leagues because mm-hmm. there's too many weekend warriors out there. So I insist on still playing in, you know, an A or a B league. So it moves pretty good for a beer league. And, you know, during the game, it's fine. But the next day, it's it's pretty rough on the joints. No, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. But I think when it comes to, because we mentioned young goaltending, that's why I let in with, uh, Talking about goaltending a bit, the Flyers could potentially have two, depending what they decide to do with the goaltenders, and then depending what happens with Felix Sandstrom, who's at UFA, so maybe three young goaltenders petitioning to be uh, the backup for Carter Hart. I think Ersan's an odd man out there because of his injury history last season, but you do have Fedotov and Sandstrom then. If Sandstrom did sign back, are you one of the people in the camp of since you already had time, give Fedotov time to adjust in the AHL to North America? Or are you, Fedotov was so good in Russia, just see what he could do in the NHL right away, forget the AHL altogether. Where, where's your kind of thoughts on uh, Ivan and where you would kind of go with him? Well, I mean, I got to see what they do this summer. They don't have a ton of cap space. I'd still be more in favor of bringing in a veteran than either of those guys, to be honest with you, because – your backup's got to play. He's got to play 23 to 30 games, you know, because of all the back-to-backs and the schedule and the grind of it. And, you know, if Carter goes down at some point for 10 days or whatever it is, that guy's going to have to play and carry it. And while well, Fedotov's been great in the KHL and had a good Olympic in a kind of different situation for the Olympics, you know, I don't know that he just jumps over and has success here. It's a I know he's played on the smaller rink a little bit over there in the KHL, but the NHL game is so different. The traffic that you deal with is far different. And, you know, where shots come from, you're talking about the the best players in the world now, too. It's a a whole different ball game. So, you know, dealing with that and just just coming over here and assuming a guy's going to stop pucks because the puck's the same size and the net's the same size is not as easy as people think. So, um, I have to see how those guys perform. I'm not making any decisions beforehand. You know, Sandstrom looked pretty good in a very small sample size. Exactly, too small to judge. Yeah, yeah. and in, in a season that didn't matter, can he do it when it matters? And a larger sample size is the question. He's been in the organization since 2015 when he was drafted, and 
has really developed. You know, Fedotov, who I saw, I think it was 2017 for the first time when he was over for development camp, was really messy. His his mechanics were really messy. Arms really, you know, not tight to the body. He's tightened a lot of that up, and he's a lot more mature now, 25 years of age. But you know, I got to see what the what a guy like Fedotov can do over here with AHL players before I'm ready to go. You get the crease as my backup in the NHL. It's too consequential uh, of a decision to make, you know, unsight unseen in North America. Yeah, I think the favorite if uh, Sandy were to come back and they didn't because of cap reasons, like you were saying, get a veteran would probably be Sandstrom just because he does have at least a small sample size. was very good because his stats are one of those guys. There's some guys, if you look at the stat sheet, yeah, it's going to be pretty accurate to what they perform. Sandstrom's one of those guys that if you just look at the stats, he's not going to be very accurate to what he performed because the Phantoms' defense was heavily injured last year and had forwards playing defense. So yeah. that you have to factor that into the equation of the goaltender's stats as well. So, all in all, I thought he saved their, as J.J. likes to say, bacon multiple times uh, in – that season like the 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 phantoms could have lost some games they lost five to one seven to one or eight yeah. to one or not like they they got helped a lot and the same token is why even though he only played like seven games when sammy was healthy that's why i'm hoping ursan can stay healthy this season he was very sharp in net too even when the defense wasn't and that's him as we talked about it's not easy to adjust to north america right away he seemed to come in and do it pretty decently. It's just he unfortunately played whatever it was, five to seven games, and then was out for the entire season. But when he was in, he actually looked like he was adjusting to the movements fine. It's just, unfortunately, he, whatever happened, he got, got bit by the injury bug. But I'm happy with the young goaltending we have, but I think from my old school side of things, too, I do kind of have that side like you that I'm like, I feel like it would be better to get the veteran too, because you can always, if the veteran sucks, then you just get let one of the young guys start anyway. So it's not really a lose situation. It's actually just a win situation for your team. So, Well, Carter's it, still young too. I think it's it, it's good to have a veteran guy there. That's a good know, point, yeah. You know, to, to be able to, to kind of help him along. You know, I mean, he's got a decent amount of NHL experience at this point at a young age, but still he is 23, going to be 24 in, in August. So it's still a young guy. So I always think it's, it's beneficial to have one of those veteran goaltenders there along with them, you know, to be a sounding board and, you know, to, to push each other in practice and I, just bringing a young guy in and having two goaltenders under the age of 24 to me is pretty, pretty tough putt. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not even opposed to I think he might, they might not want to pay him what he earned from how solid he did as a backup. But if Marty wanted to stay, I wouldn't be opposed to that at all either because I thought Jones did fine as a backup. I think his stats were more the team They're didn't team always reflective. play. Great. Yeah. yeah, they were team reflective, exactly. Like he, yeah. the team didn't play the best in front of him where if he came back, that would honestly be the best case scenario for me because then I already know what I'm getting and I don't have to worry about anything. Yeah, I think the decision they'll make on that will be depending on what they do in the offseason and free agency and how they handle JVR's contract and 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 what's left over. If they're in a position where they have the ability to, to sign a guy like Martin Jones, then perhaps you do it. If, but that in the, you just may not have a choice. They may not have the dollars to be able to do it and have to go with the Sandstrom or you know somebody in the system already on an, on an ELC. So how that plays out, we'll, we'll see, you know, that's going to take some time. We won't even probably know that until August when free agency is basically done. So, um, but you know, there'll be options there. There'll be guys available. Those veterans are always out there that you can pay, you know, a million and a half, two million to. I mean, the savings is not that great. If you pay Martin Jones a million and a half, or you're paying, uh, you know, a, a player on an ELC, it, it's about six hundred thousand dollars savings. Is yeah. it worth it? A known commodity versus an unknown? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. That is a good way of looking. I think somebody, if Dallas doesn't keep him because of how he did as a backup, they might be able to get Wedgwood on the decent deal if Marty yeah. Jones. I was looking at the free agency a couple of because all the other guys are more very big wild cards. Like, you have no idea at all what you're getting if you get DeLeo or Subban. If you get Copley, you don't really know what you're getting at the NHL level. So, 
AHL level great. NHL level, sometimes it's up here, sometimes it's not. So I feel like there's a lot of guys like that. If Yari stays healthy, maybe Yaroslav Halak could still be a good backup at 38, but that, again, is a whole health concern because he's 38. So, like, there's, guy, there's guys they could get, but they're all – and then Grice is coming off of having a better second half but not a good season. Mm-hmm. So, like, I – but I've always liked Grice and – Grice and um, – a couple of these other guys, it's just they're kind of at the tail end where I wouldn't mind giving them a shot, though, because, again, like you said, they're they're experienced. And worst comes to worst, if you grab Tomas Grice and he can, continues to unfortunately struggle, we have good young goaltending. And if they're doing good, you can just give them a shot then anyway. Where getting backup goaltending is hard, but usually there's somebody you can find via the waiver wire. Like Dallas just happened to stumble across. Scott Wedgwood, and then he happened to become a very good backup goaltender for them. So, yeah, I think if you are sleuth enough with it, you can find a backup goalie, but you should do a better job at making sure you have one to start, like you said. Yeah, I mean, there's guys out. I mean, look at like Louis Domingue comes in in the playoffs for Pittsburgh, and yeah. there, there's guys, there's a lot, there's good goaltending out there that you could you'll be able to find. Yeah, I agree with that. I think as a uh, wrap up point, as we're uh, rounding out here, I think a good thing to talk about would be. When it comes to John Tortorella, a big thing that I notice with teams he tends to be very good at is getting the most out of players on their special teams as well, where obviously the Flyers, we want to see improvement on both ends of that. And I think Oscar Lindblom's a guy that might really see bonus playing time on the special teams, with, in my opinion, because I think Torres is really going to like how he can play in front of the net and be that guy that he takes advantage of his size that's going to continue to grow now. I want to say three is three years removed from yeah, this will be the third year. Yeah, the third yeah. year. So I feel like this is the year to kind of click it all back in. But I feel like, for me, the power play is huge for this. If this team wants to be the quick turnaround that, obviously, Dave Scott wants, if they want that, I think the biggest key is not just playing better motor-wise and defense-wise. It's also making sure your special teams is latched on because I don't think we're going to be that good 5-on-5 five five that our special teams can't be great. You know, the special teams, that's going to be have to be a huge improvement because they were horrid last year for the Flyers. And, you know, Torts teams, generally speaking, are always good on the PK. I don't know who he's going to be bringing in to run the PK or the power play. We'll probably find that out whenever he's announced um, or they'll announce that, you know, they're going through that process right now. His six years in Columbus, their PK was not good. Um, I mean, one year they had a in 16, 17, they were the 12th ranked power play in the NHL. Other than that, they were always in the 20s. And for his six year tenure in Columbus, he had the 29th ranked power play at 17.1%. So it's that's not good enough. Um, it's going to have to be much better than that. So whoever comes in to run the power play, they've got to do a really good job because that has to improve. You have to be able to punish a team when they go in the box. And the PK. I think they have the pieces for the PK. I think last year, part of it was the season was sideways and so many injuries, partially on the power play as well. But they got to figure out the special teams. They've got to get better. And, you know, the head coach ultimately is responsible for all of it. But who they bring in to run the power play in PK will be really interesting uh, to going forward to, to see philosophically what, they, what they're going to do. And on the power play, it's got to start with zone possession and getting the puck in and getting set up and then having a plan and, and being able to execute. They haven't been able to do that. Torts' teams have not been great at that. They got to get better at that element, and so do his teams. Yeah, I think uh, I know Steele and I've talked about this guy, Lance Green, that does the uh, Hockey Writers Inc. show, talked about him. Chris Noble was with Hackstall. He's mm-hmm. more of an offensive minded head coach. He, yes, the Wolfpack, I understand, or the Wolf, the, yeah, the Wolfpack fell off, but they were more of an offensive team than anything else. And that's what his strong suit is. So I feel like him being the power play guy with Torch could actually work because offense is his strong suit first and foremost. So he's very good at position. Even McDavid's complimented him saying when I was a junior, so he was great at telling me positionally where to. So yeah, he was here before. I mean, Oblock was here Jesus, before. Yeah, and he was here before. So yeah. I feel like he fits perfectly because he's exactly what you want, knows the city knows the team already some of the guys that are still here i think that's just too perfect of a fit not to look at it but that's just kind of my own opinion 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if they'll go back to somewhere where they've already been. You know, like you mentioned, he was here with Hack, and um, so I don't know if they'll go back to that or not, but they got to find the right person. I don't know if, you know, Torts has certain guys that he brings to every city. I mean, he had Mike Sullivan for years, Mm -hmm. but obviously Sully's in Pittsburgh now and doing a great job. So, um, but you got to be able to rely on those assistant coaches and they got to do a good job. And they got, that's one huge area where they can improve right away. And that's tangible on, on not only on the scoreboard, but in the result by getting power play goals. Those are the goals that this team had to work so hard to score last year and to get good scoring chances. And you got to sometimes be able to score goals without a ton of effort, you know, and, it, and creating a ton of mayhem and having have so many things go right to get the result of a goal. Sometimes you got to be able to score off the rush. They haven't been able to do that and score on the power play off a set play. And they haven't been able to do that. So you got to be able to punish teams for that in the NHL. I mean, you look at this year, scoring was up. Why? Because power play percentages were up so much. That's why scoring was up league wide. So um, they got to improve that big time. Yeah, especially if the league's going to start getting cold. You kind of alluded to it there, but get cold more like it does nowadays than it did in the past. You're going to really need to improve upon your power play big time. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to get lost in the shuffle, unless if your five on five play is that spectacular. And with the way that guys are still developing, I don't expect it to be that spectacular five on five that it'll counterbalance not having a good power play. But that's why I feel like even if it's not Nobla, I feel like somebody that fits into that coaching style needs to be your power play head coach. That's just all about position. Like the key characteristic is I'm looking at this and I see a, a puzzle in my mind. If this is what you should be, this is what you should be, this is what you should be. And they see that right away. Anybody that's like that should be the guy they have in mind for the power play. Because Torts obviously sees that seemingly with the PK. Because like you said, the PK seems to be – seeing stuff like that and does well at positioning guys power play not so much so if you can get somebody that does that with the power play that seems like a match made in heaven i know from reading the twitter sphere some people do want us the penalty kill coach with tortorella our good old uh friend ricky uh but uh i don't know if he would want to be an assistant head coach rather than a head coach but more power to him if he came in as an assistant coach i'd be fine with it so yeah but, We'll see what happens when it comes to that. I think that would honestly do him justice because if he came in to grade at that, I think he would have a better chance than just sitting uh, calling games uh, or not calling games, but on uh, ESPN doing stuff in T- or TNT, whatever one he's on. But that's just my own take. But Jason, we're, I really do thank you for hopping on. I really appreciate it. Um, we did a very good um, 30, about 40 minutes. Uh, we got a lot into four. It felt like it was longer than 40 minutes, but I really appreciate you hopping on. I'll definitely have you on again uh, in the future. Uh, follow him. Definitely check out Flyers Daily. You also have, don't you have the other podcast too? Yeah, you want to Stick to Hockey that? Live. Yeah, the stick. Yeah, that one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I was gonna say I was gonna say stick hockey live, so I was gonna say that wrong and butcher it like an asshole. So it's a good thing I passed that over to you to, <laughs> to uh, say it. But you can follow me at JJ Burke 26 and at Sports Fanatic News. Please just continue to subscribe. Thanks all. Have a good day and enjoy the hockey. The cup is upon us. Real quick, who do you got in the cup? I have Tampa in six. Abs in seven. Abs in seven. All right. Yep. Peace out, everybody, and stay safe.